Give me praise to God with respect and esteem to our illustrious visionary, Pastor Campbell, to each of you. Uh, I stand tonight uh, to introduce our preacher for tonight. There's so many things I can say about him, but I am of the school of Dr. C.A.W. Clark, uh, who says that the best way to introduce a preacher is just to get out the way and let the Holy Ghost I uh, introduced him. Those of you who had the privilege to uh, sit in his word shop, uh, you know he is uh, scholarly. Uh, he is a prepared preacher, uh, earned Ph.D., uh, one of the most sought-after preachers across this country. Uh, and we praise God and we're blessed to have him here at the Word Conference he is the pastor of the Calvary Church in Morristown, New Jersey. Phenomenal ministry, doing a great work there. Uh, he's a preacher that has preached in uh, every conference imaginable across the globe. Uh, and I'm sure if you pray, he will preach. The voice you will hear now will be that of Dr. Jerry Carter. Let's receive him at this time. Amen. Gracious God, our Father, we thank you for your total sufficiency, your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the privilege of being gathered together one more time. We pray now for preaching clarity, for preaching purpose, for preaching productivity so that um, when it's done, indeed, the growth is ours, but the glory is yours. Move some stuff out the way. Break up some solid rock. Plant the seed of your word in the soil of our hearts. In the strong name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Well, this is the day the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in this day. All right, let's see. Let's try that again. This is the day the Lord has made, and I will rejoice and be glad in this day. Um, First of all, to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and uh, without whom we wouldn't be here. We thank God for, for him and then for uh, Dr. Campbell. Thank you for, first of all, your, your vision and your courage to see it through. This is not easy to do, and I know it personally, um, but I believe God is pleased, and I don't say that lightly. Please, so I want to thank you for your vision and courage and then for your generosity in letting me come and share in this conference where I've been, um, been uh, richly blessed just by sitting up feet of presenters who are here and then being able to fellowship with many of you. Um, so my friends are here, and I'm thankful for that, for Pastor Pleasant and for uh, the strength of his ministry and the bond of our brotherhood. As I often say when I preach on the West Coast, for me right now it's 10.35. <laughs> so I hope that the look you have <laughs> is no indication of the energy you possess. Because <laughs> I need you to push me through this right here because it's, it's 7.30 for you, but it's 10.30 for, for me. Um, then let me just say this. I'm, I'm blessed to be teamed with Dr. Trayvon Lee. Um, he, he and I have done this before, and uh, I just appreciate the privilege of being with him, but I really appreciate the privilege of being before him. <laughs> yes. Revelation chapter 10, verse 8. And I'll be reading from the New International Version here. Revelation 10 and 8. 
pray you will hear these words. Then the voice that I had heard from heaven spoke to me once more. It said, go, take the scroll or the book that lies open in the hand of the angel who was standing on the sea and on the land. So I went to the angel and asked him to give me the little scroll. He said to me, take it and eat it. It will turn your stomach sour, but in your mouth it will be sweet as honey. I took the little scroll from the angel's hand and ate it. It tasted as sweet as honey in my mouth, but when I had eaten it, my stomach turned bitter or sour. Then I was told you must prophesy again about many peoples, nations, languages, and kings. Amen. You may be seated. It will turn bitter in your stomach, but in your mouth it will be as sweet as honey. I want to talk about a bittersweet assignment. A bittersweet assignment. I think it was the year 2012 um, where I was privileged to travel in the country of Turkey as a part of a uh, Muslim and Christian dialogue program. And one of the cities that we visited in Turkey was the ancient city of Ephesus. Ephesus allegedly is the place where John the Apostle was buried. Ephesus is the place of the Agora, the ancient marketplace in the book of Acts. Ephesus is the place where after having preached there for several months, the Apostle Paul was literally run out of the city. But what impressed me the most about being in Ephesus is being able to stand on the mountainside and have the tour guide to point out into the Asian Sea and said, miles out there is the Isle of Patmos where John was exiled in an attempt to get him to shut up. <laughs> but once you read the book of Revelation, it's clear that their objective was not achieved. Because whatever else John does in Revelation, the last thing he does is shut up. <laughs> Matter of fact, the intention of the enemy is turned upside down. Because the Apostle John reports that he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. In exile, but in the spirit on the Lord's day. In exile but in the spirit on the Lord's day. In exile, but in the spirit on the Lord's day. The Lord opens up heaven and allows John to see some things. He wants John to see something because he wants him to say something. And if he doesn't see anything, he can't say anything. No one who hasn't seen anything can't say anything. But if you've seen something, you ought to say something. John was shown some things that he might say something. And the reason why he was shown something was that he might see something because the people to whom he spoke needed to hear something. And the only way they would hear something is if he said something. And the only way he could say something is if he had seen something. And the people needed to hear something because they were suffering brutal and uh, unimaginable persecution at the hands of the Roman emperor. They needed a word. Land had been confiscated. Families had been separated. They needed a word. 
they needed to hear, they needed to hear that, 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 that Jesus was alive. They needed to hear that he was Alpha and Omega, the beginning point and the end point, first and the last, so that whatever happened to them happened in between him. If he's the Alpha and Omega, <laughs> feels like I'm alone in here. If he's first and last, then whatever I'm going through is in between who he is. Because nothing that I'm going through could be before he is or after he's no more. Look, it, everything I'm going through is right in between him. He's Alpha and Omega. He's first and the last. They needed to hear that. They needed to hear that, that, that they were to be faithful unto death. And they would be rewarded with the crown of life. And so here it is. John is in a context of isolation and tribulation where he receives revelation. And, and maybe being on Patmos was necessary for him to see what he saw. Because revelation is seen most brilliantly against the backdrop of tribulation and isolation. There's certain, certain things you can't see <laughs> until you're in exile. Now, I get it. Being in Ephesus is, is preferable but being on Patmos is more profitable. Being, on, being in Ephesus is, is more comfortable. But being on Patmos is, is, is better for what God wants you to see. And I'm looking at somebody right now who as embarrassing and humiliating and isolating as Patmos has been. You can look back and say, Lord, I thank you for the season of isolation and tribulation because now... I have testimony that I never would have had. Now, I have power to preach that I never would have had. Now, I got power to sing and teach that I never would have had. Here was John on the Isle of Patmos in a context of isolation and tribulation. And he receives revelation. He looks in here in chapter 10. He looks up into heaven. And once again, he sees a strong angel. Sees a strong angel. Mm-hmm. The angel has uh, an open book in his hand <laughs> with one foot on land, one foot on sea. Uh-huh. And it may not look so uh, 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 may not look so inviting to you, but uh, he can put one land on one foot on land and one foot on sea because God owns both. And you can put your foot on what you own and Okay, he, 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 he has one foot on land. I preach for myself. One foot on sea. And, and the, the angel is there to remind John of what his assignment is. The angel is there tonight to remind us of what our assignment actually is and the nature of the assignment. Now, it's strange to me that this is in the middle of the book of Revelation. And John had already been active in his assignment. He had already preached quite a few sermons. He had already run quite a few revivals. He had already been on major platforms. He had already celebrated several anniversaries. But in the middle of his ministry, he needs to be reminded of his assignment. Because sometimes you can get so good at the assignment that you forget what it really is. And, and here is John, perhaps sometimes blinded by the accoutrements of ministry, needed to be reminded of what the assignment is. And after several years of assignment, sometimes you just get cynical. Okay, looks like I got a real holy crowd here, but do I have any honest people here? Any honest preachers here? Any honest ministers here who would admit with me that you have seasons? When you feel like quitting on this thing, you have seasons when it doesn't feel worth it. It's at that time that the Lord sends an angel and reminds you of what your assignment is and the nature of that. And I'm going to get out the way after I give us a few clues on the nature of, of, of our assignment on the night. He says, he says, I want you to notice, first of all, the humility of the assignment. He says, the, 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 there, there's an angel pictured here. And the angel has an open book in his hand, inviting John to come over. He has an open book, as if to say, 
everything you need to say is accessible to you. It's open. It's here. You don't need to go out and make up anything. You don't need any new revelation. Speak what's here. And you're on safe ground if you say what's been said. <laughs> Can you all hear me over here? Because I'm not getting any indication that you all hear me. It, it, the safest thing you can do is to say what's been said. Because if it's been said, that means it's worth saying. The book is open. <laughs> it's not closed. You have access to what's in the book. And he looks at the proclaimer of God, whether you be preacher or lay person, he declares that the book is open. Now he says, what I need you to do is go get the book. <laughs> I'm not going to bring it to you. Oh, no, I'm not going to drop the sermon in your lap. You, you're, it's open to you, but you may have to sweat to access it. The word is there, but you may have to spend some hours going after. And when, even when it gets to the angel, he's, uh, John says, give me the book. The angel says, take it. <laughs> They're like, I'm alone. And he said, that, look, look, the angel said, I, look, I'm not going to put it in your lap. You may have to sit yourself down in the seat of a chair, open up some books, go, go, engage in prayer, uh, seek the mind of the Lord and sweat a little bit in order to access the word that is accessible to you. So the sermon is born of the openness of the book and the investment of your energy. <laughs> he said, he said, this is, this is a this is a, an assignment that's characterized by humility. Humility because what's interesting in chapter 10 is early on when you hear references to the scroll or the book, the word literally is book or scroll, like whole book. But when John goes to grab it, the narrator says that he has the little book. He has the little scroll. You're missing me. When the book is presented, it's a book. But when he receives it, it's a booklet. Because what was presented is not what's received. Okay, because the preacher at your best, when you stand to preach, all you really got is the booklet. The book is here. So wait a minute, wait a minute. The text is always bigger than your sermon. And that's why when you go to preach it the second time and the third time, you always get a new angle on it because all you got initially was the booklet. And that's why I wish I had help here. That's why nobody here can get arrogant or conceited about how you killed the house. All it was was a booklet. You, you, yeah, I don't care what kind of platforms you have had preaching at Hampton, preaching at the convention. All it was was a booklet. At our best, I said, at our best, we stand in the shoes of Job, who said all he could do was to inhabit <laughs> the outskirts of the ways of God. Every time I preach, all I'm doing is inhabiting the outskirts of his ways and his mind. I don't care what the press clippings say. And that, I don't care what the people say. When they introduce you, all you're doing is hanging out in the outskirts of the ways of God. And that's why Gardner Taylor says that, that at our best, preaching is a grand failure. It's a failure because our language is so limited in order to describe the ineffable mystery of the ways of God. But it's grand because somehow or another, the truth gets through my limitations. Every time I stand, it's a grand failure. Oh, bless his name. 
Look, 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 John says, uh, or rather the angel says, I want you to be aware of the humility of your assignment so nobody in here, I don't care how many degrees you have, how many accolades they bestow upon you, can walk around with your noses up in the air because at your best, all you did was to declare a booklet. says there's something else to, to your assignment, not just the humility of your assignment, but I want you to notice the responsibility of your assignment. He says, I need you to go get the booklet that's in the hand of the angel. Then I would imagine that the moment that John gets the book, that he's anxious to declare what's in it. I would imagine he's excited about that time about having the book in his hand and declaring what's there. But there's a step in between getting it and saying it. <laughs> he said, you got it, but you can't just jump to saying it. In between, he says, I need you to eat it. <laughs> Because Psalm 119 calls the word honey. <laughs> oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Matthew 4.4 4 calls the word bread. Uh, 1 Corinthians 3 and 1 calls the word meat. 2 Peter 2 and 2 calls the word milk. A a if you follow the analogy on, if the word is seen as honey, meat, bread, and milk, that means it has a certain edibility to it. And he says the first thing after you get the word, the preacher has to do is to eat the word. To eat the word means more than just to read commentaries. To eat the word means more than just to gather or Google for illustrations. To eat the word means more than just to do your exege exegetical work. To eat the word means to sit there and ponder over it and ingest it until it becomes a part of your system. Until you have incarnated the word to the point that the word is you. So as I'm preaching, I'm not just preaching a sermon, but I'm giving you me because I have bridged the existential difference between existential distance between the sermon and the preacher. Oh, you miss me. Ah, I'll touch your neighbor, tell him, eat it, eat it, eat it, eat it, eat it. If, if you're really going to say it, he says, you have to consume the word. Because I want you here yeah, to become what you are preaching. No wonder, no wonder, no wonder, no wonder, no wonder the Lord told um, what's his name? Hosea, I need you to get married before you preach. <laughs> Wish I had three Bible readers here. He said, I need you to go marry Hosea. I need you to marry the sermon. And her name is Gomer. And the reason why I need you to marry her is because I need, once again, the distance between preacher and message to be, I need that chasm to be gulped. I need that to be taken care of because when you stand, I don't just want you to give a message. I want you to give you. Eat it. Eat it. You can't rush and just throw something together on Saturday night. And expect to eat it. You got to brood over that thing. You got to brood over that thing. You got to give it time to percolate so that it becomes a part of who you are. Go get it. Eat it. I, I'm almost done with your preacher's coming. But listen, look, look, look. And the reason why I want you to eat it is because you are in as much need of what you're preaching as those to whom you're preaching it. You, you yourself need to feed off of the same word that you're preaching. So before you become speaker in public, I need you to become audience in private. <laughs> this is what I need you to do. I need you to stand as a nourished preacher because an anorexic preacher doesn't look good. 
One, two. <laughs> you can sit there if you want to. I know I'm telling the truth. Nobody wants to hear an anorexic preacher. I want to hear somebody who's been fed themselves. <laughs> Eat it. Eat it because I need you fed. Eat it. Eat it, eat it, eat it, because I, I don't want you recommending nothing you haven't tasted. <laughs> when my son graduated from high school, immediately just to make a little money, he got a job at a local restaurant, and uh, part of that job was serving tables, washing dishes, whatever they needed him to do. But before he could wait and serve tables, he had to taste everything on the menu. <laughs> In case anybody who was eating needed him to recommend something on the menu, they wanted to make sure he tasted it first so that he could speak with integrity. Listen, the best thing you can do is taste what you're preaching. It's hard for me to say, oh, taste and see if the Lord, that the Lord is good if I've never tasted it. Eat it. Eat it until your sermon Eat it until the sermon becomes a, a conviction. Eat it until the truth becomes a conviction. I can stand and lecture on, uh, I don't know, James Cone's idea of black liberation being the axiological lens through which we look at God without really eating that. I can stand and lecture on Kierkegaard's teleological suspension of the ethical without really eating that. I can stand and lecture on uh, Boltman's uh, idea of demythologizing without really eating that. But I can't stand up and preach on the grace of God if I've never tasted his grace. Can I preach on the night? When I talk about grace, I'm not talking about anything I know in theory. I am what I am by the grace of God. He woke me up this morning by grace. He started me on my way. Is there anybody here who knows anything about grace? See, unless I've really eaten what I've preached, what I'm preaching, I'm just really engaging in gossiping about God. <laughs> and I wonder how many times we mount the pulpit just gossiping about the gospel. But if you've eaten the gospel, if you know for yourself that he woke you up, then I'm sorry. <laughs> look, 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 the angel stands tonight just to give us some, some sense of the nature of our assignment. He says, I want you to be aware of the humility of your assignment, the responsibility of your assignment. But finally, I want you to notice, and I'm done here, I want you to notice the irony of the assignment. He says, the angel has an open book in his hand. Angel has an open book. Go get it. Access it. Eat it. Ingest it. He, but, he, but he warns him. He says, when you eat it, it's going to be bitter in your stomach, sweet in your mouth. Yeah, bitter in your stomach, sweet to your mouth. He said, I, I, I really want you to be aware that ministry, the nature of it is bittersweet. It's, it's bittersweet because of the nature of what I want you to say. <laughs> because your message is going to be this hybrid declaration of both affirmation and correction. <laughs> you can't affirm everything in people. And, and nowadays, everybody wants affirmation. Wants somebody to stand and say, I'm okay, with a smile on my face. You're okay. And as long as we're engaging in self-improvement, everything is all right. Some things can't be affirmed. Some things have to be correct. Matter of fact, John himself in his preaching ministry to the seven churches will often begin with commendation and affirmation. 
God is aware of how faithful you've been. But then he would hurry on, hasten to say, nevertheless, <laughs> I have something against you. That's what you call a bittersweet ministry, a bittersweet proclamation. He says it's bittersweet because of the nature of your word. It's bittersweet because of the reaction to your word. Not everybody is going to react the way you want them to react. Oh, yeah, he said, he said, matter of fact, when, when you look even at a couple of the prophets, look at, look at, look at Ezekiel, if you will. And then over that third chapter, he, the, the Lord tells him to eat the word as well. And it's going to be honey in your mouth. But in the verse after that, he says, but I'm sending you to a rebellious house. You'll catch it on the way home. Look, he, he looks at Jeremiah and sweetly says to him that, that before I formed you, I knew you. He affirms him with all of this and that and the other. And, you, and you, you're going to be this and my hand is going to be on you. But then he raises the reality of the bitter when he says, don't be afraid of their faith. Okay, you're going to catch it. Come here, Isaiah. Isaiah said, I had a sweet moment when I saw the Lord high and lifted up. And his train filled the temple. And later on, I saw myself as I was. And I said, I am undone. I am unclean. And I dwell amongst a people with unclean lips. And the moment I confessed who I was, he, he, he commissioned one of the seraphim to get a live coal off the altar, touch my lips, and I was made clean. That was sweet to me. But then he came with some bitter news. He said, I'm sending you to people who have ears but can't hear. I'm trying to tell you ministry is bitter. Real ministry is, anybody in here know anything about the bitters and the sweets of ministry? It's bitter sweet. Ministry involves some hallelujahs and some hellish days. Ministry involves some, some triumphant entries into Jerusalem and some painful crucifixions on Calvary. And if you can't handle both seasons, you're in the wrong business. <laughs> and I'm closing when I tell you that. I, I, I'm just afraid. I'm just afraid sometimes when I talk to younger preachers who have the wrong impression of ministry. <laughs> because all they've seen are the sweets. They've seen the sweets of preaching on major platforms. They've seen the sweets of driving nice cars, wearing tailor-made suits and fine shoes. They've seen the sweets of being pampered by overly attentive armor bearers and adjutants. They see the sweets of that attention, but nobody has told them about the bitters. And that's why we've raised a generation of sweet preachers because they have no idea of what the bitters are. Have no idea of the bitters of failed vision. Have no idea of the bitters of having to deal with domestic upheaval and still having to preach. Have no idea. Of the bitters of having the people closest to you to turn on you. I'm taking my seat, but is anybody here who knows something about both seasons? Anybody know something about the sweets of ministry and the bitters of ministry? But I'm going to tell you this right here, no matter how sweet it gets, no matter how bitter it gets, that last verse says, just do it again. <laughs> I'm going home. I got to go back to New Jersey. Look the, look, 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 the angel looks at, what's his name, John, and says, but I need you to prophesy again. Because no matter how bitter some of your days have been, I need you to preach again. I know you've had some days where you flunked and you failed in the pulpit. But go ahead and preach again. I know you've had some seasons where you didn't even feel worthy to stand up in the pulpit. But touch your neighbor, tell them, do it again. I don't care how difficult it is, do it again. Because the reason that the word is bitter in your stomach is because that's not where it's supposed to be. The reason why it's sweet in your mouth is because that's where it's supposed to be. The word is not meant for you to just uh, enjoy it in your stomach. It's meant for you to declare it. And the reason you ought to declare it on tonight is because the book is open. I said the book is open. This is the same book in chapter 10 
that was closed in chapter 5. When John sees the vision in chapter 5, he sees the book in the hand of the one who's in the middle of the throne. But the book is sealed with seven seals. And, and, and nothing that's in the book will come to pass unless somebody is found who's worthy to open up the book. And so there was an interrogation in heaven. Somebody raised the interrogative, who is worthy to open up the Lamb's book of life? And they searched, they put together a pulpit committee. And they searched high and low, trying to find somebody who was worthy to open up the book. And John began to weep because nobody was found worthy to open up the book. But one of the angels stood up and said, John, stop weeping because somebody has been found who has prevailed to open up the book. As a matter of fact, it cost him his life. He had to bleed a little bit. He got nails in his hands. He got nails in his feet. And he got thorns in his head. He prevailed to open up the book. It cost him too much to open up the book for you not to preach it. Take your neighbor by the hand and tell him it cost him too much. It cost him his life. It cost him his blood. It cost him his body. Every time I get a chance to preach his word, I'm going to preach his word because you have been put on assignment. It's bitter and it's sweet, but the book is open. Go home and preach it. <laughs>